What drives a group of students to rampage across a university campus, hunt down one of their classmates and beat him to death? I'm Sekhanda Kamani, and for this edition of Assignment on the BBC World Service, I'm in Pakistan to try and answer that question and what it might mean for this huge Muslim country's volatile debate over blasphemy. And a warning, some of what's to come might be inappropriate for some audiences. The victim's name was Mashal Khan. This is him talking to an online radio station about his interest in left-wing books, promoting social justice and redistribution of wealth. <laughs> Our BBC team was one of the few outlets to cover his funeral back in April. Many Pakistani TV channels were too nervous about being seen to support someone accused of committing blasphemy. But his father helped change public opinion with a dignified and articulate response just hours after cleaning and burying his son's battered body. There's no freedom of speech in this country. They cut people's tongues. They killed my son and then laid the blame on him. I'm his father. He used to talk lovingly about the Prophet Muhammad. A month after the funeral, his father showed me around Mashal's bedroom in the family home. A long shelf in the small, simple room was covered with academic awards. These trophies are from school and these ones are from college. Mashal's father has been inundated with media requests since the killing. Most now believe Mashal was wrongly accused of blasphemy and TV channels are confident enough to cover the case. Ahead of my visit, Mashal's father had already laid photos of him out on the bed. Mashal was a tall, well-built young man with a slightly chubby and happy face. It's how the family want to remember him. When his father played a song dedicated to Mashal, his eyes watered up. He was a mystic, philosopher and poet, a writer by birth. He was very loving. He talked about peace, patience and non-violence. Mishal grew up in the small village of Zeda in northern Pakistan. It's a dusty place surrounded by green fields, similar to villages across the country. Mishal had opportunities many here didn't. He earned a scholarship to study in Russia a few years back. Initially, he wanted to become an engineer, but inside he was a poet and writer. So he later said, I want to become a journalist. He wanted to work exposing injustice. And then he applied to study at the Abdul Wali Khan University. Abdul Wali Khan University is in the city of Mardan. It's about an hour's drive from where Mashal grew up. It only opened in 2009. Some 12,000 students attend lectures in the large, impressive marble buildings dotted around a campus that's wide, open and green. The university closed for weeks after Mashal's lynching. Students only began to return in May. Today's the first day that the university has reopened and there's long lines of students coming in, in cars and motorcycles. They're all being searched by police officers and having to show their ID cards. You get an idea of how traditional the university must be in some ways. Practically all the male students are dressed in traditional Pakistani shavakamis, the long shirts and uh, wide trousers, and virtually all the female students have both their faces and their hair covered as well. Michal stood out here, not just for his intelligence, but for his liberal views. He quickly made friends, including Fahim Alam Khan. He taught me a lot. He taught me life. He taught me language. It's, it's a big loss for me. Fahim studied journalism with Michal. They became friends on the first day of class. 
And what was your first impression of him? That he's a kind of a genius guy, a very intelligent, brilliant. On the very first day, I thought. Really? From the first day? The very first day. What was it about him that made you think that? His thoughts, the way he spoke in the class. We used to talk about culture, politics. Fahim switches to Urdu and tells me Mashal talked about socialism and communism. He thought capitalism led to inequality in society. He used to read Karl Marx. He was a big fan of Karl Marx. Mashal described himself as a Muslim, a liberal and a mystic. Fahim says Mashal never said anything blasphemous in front of him, but that he would discuss religion with students he described as religious fanatics. And what would they talk about? What was their discussions about? About Islam and religion. At times, the debates turned into threats. Mashal was accused of being an agnostic or even an atheist. After that, Fahim says Mashal started carrying Muslim prayer beads as a show of faith. Did he ever think that he should stop talking about his views? Or Yeah, several times he told that, but I think he couldn't. Uh, he was outspoken. For most people, a university is where ideas should be debated and challenged. But some students and even staff on this campus believed Michelle had crossed the line. And that justified his killing. To understand what happened to Michelle Khan, we need to understand blasphemy in Pakistan. It's hard to overstate what a powerful issue it's become in recent years. Blasphemy is a crime. The penal code contains clauses outlawing the insulting of any religion and defiling the Quran. Making derogatory remarks about the Prophet Muhammad is a special category that carries the death sentence. The state has imprisoned many for blasphemy, but never actually executed anyone for it. Over the years, Dozens of people accused of blasphemy have, like Mashal Khan, been killed by mobs. In Pakistan, it's not just particular individuals or certain religious lobby groups that are making an issue out of blasphemy. It's also the state. In the lead-up to Mashal's killing, the authorities were talking about banning all social media to prevent what they call blasphemous material being spread online. And even after Mashal's death, the Pakistan Telecoms Authority sent out this text message to all Pakistanis saying, uploading and sharing of blasphemous content on the internet is a punishable offence under the law. Such content should be reported for legal action. And what critics say is that this kind of message encourages a kind of vigilantism. If you spot a blasphemer near you, call us up. If you see something blasphemous online, let us know. Lawyer Gibran Nasser mocks the idea but knows the issue is deadly serious. He supported Mashal Khan's family and others accused of blasphemy. For the past four months, I've been waiting for a mob to surround me because I have personally been exposed to that threat. I have been called an atheist, a blasphemer, somebody who engages in propaganda against Allah, the Prophet and the Quran. But whatever luck, it hasn't happened. He says officials are creating a climate of fear around blasphemy. The blasphemy law does not have an exhaustive definition or for that matter any decent definition of what really is blasphemy. By putting out such an ad, you've left it to the acumen of a lay person to describe for himself what is blasphemy. That blasphemy law has a history of being used for ulterior motives in this country. At one time, the notion or the thing or plan of action in Pakistan was that if somebody wanted to get someone killed, they'll go hire what we came to know as target killers mercenaries. Now, just release a rumour that this guy committed blasphemy. He'll either be killed or forced to leave the country. Blasphemy allegations are being used as a way to settle personal feuds. And Mashal was outspoken, charismatic and high-achieving. There were plenty of people who resented him. Mashal's father believes this interview with a local TV channel of Mashal alleging corruption in the university a few days before his death led to a conspiracy against him. And police have collected evidence suggesting student politicians, jealous of his influence, wanted him expelled. 
we don't know how much, if at all, these issues contributed to Michelle's death. But here's what we do know about the day he was killed. On the morning of April the 13th, a group of students accused Michel and two of his friends of blasphemy and demanded to see the lecturers. In a meeting, they were challenged to provide proof which they didn't have, and tempers began to flare. More students and university staff got involved. A security guard shouted that anyone who supported Michel was also committing blasphemy. Michel wasn't there in the meeting, but the mob attacked his friend and a lecturer who were. Police rescued them, but the mob then went looking for Michal. This is Michal's hostel. Here's his room. It's still in the same condition. It's kind of incredible. I came here the day after the murder. It's now over a month. And it's like nothing's changed. Mattresses are piled up against the wall. Another mattress looks to be covered in dried blood stains. It seems to be the, what's left over of a last meal and all his possessions are just scattered across the floor. The only thing that seems to have changed is that here he had a poster of Che Guevara and a poster of Karl Marx and someone's ripped them down. You know, you see all the things that he's written across the walls. That's perhaps the best insight. You know, some of it seems to be just private jokes between him and some of his closest friends. Others, you know, they give you an insight into the way he used to think. Freedom is the right of every individual. You know, don't be afraid of being outnumbered. And then on this side, given he's accused of committing blasphemy, it says, Allah is the greatest and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. And that's his handwriting. But it wasn't enough to save him being accused of blasphemy. Mashal, in his last hours, knew that a mob were after him. His friends and teachers thought that he had left the university, but he hadn't. He was trying to hide from the mob here. I've seen Mashal's phone records from that day. They reveal he sent a frantic series of calls and text messages in the minutes leading up to the lynching. One of his friends, who wasn't at the university, showed me a message he had received. It reads... They are wrongly accusing me of having insulted the prophet. His friend asks, what will you do? No answer. Then again, Michal, where are you? But it was too late. Imagine hiding here from a mob that you see out the window, coming towards you. There's nowhere to go. He's got nowhere to escape to. He'd have heard the mob banging down on the other doors trying to find him. They got him. These are the bloodstains where... It seems the authorities think that Michal was lined up against the wall and shot. A number of eyewitnesses have told me that two or three really brave guys carried him out of the room and back down the stairs. They were trying to take him to hospital and they were taking him down and he was a heavy guy, so there was three of them. But when they got to the bottom of the stairs, the mob had reassembled and they grabbed... Michal's body back, and they continued to beat him. Michal's friend Fahim was there, watching in horror. They were beating him with sticks and uh, bricks and all that stuff. They were happy. When they were beating him, they were happy. The mob continued to beat Michal long after he was dead. Police were present but were either unable or unwilling to stop the violence. They eventually recovered his battered body and took it to his father, Iqbal. The men of the family cleaned his body and then it was brought before his mother, sisters and other relatives. It was a huge injustice which I can't describe in words. A university spokesman admitted they'd failed to prevent their students adopting such extreme beliefs but said it was part of a wider failure in Pakistani society. The videos of the attack are deeply disturbing, and I'm still trying to understand why things turned so violent on that particular day. The only people that really know the answer 
of the accused. Police have arrested dozens of suspects, including students and some university employees. I've seen some of their written statements. They make fascinating reading. Some say they'd previously been friends with Mashal. Many admit they'd never actually heard Mashal commit blasphemy. They only heard allegations that he had. The statements also reveal a level of pettiness that would be laughable had the outcome not been so horrific. More than one person complained about the pet dog Michelle kept on campus. The first statement recorded by police was leaked to the media. It was that of one of Michelle's classmates. His name is Wajahat. In the ornate language of the Pakistani court system, Wajahat says he's long accused Michelle of having nefarious and devilish designs and an anti-Islamic attitude. Wajahat emerges as a key figure. He's not accused of beating Michelle. He's accused of helping incite the attacks by allegedly calling Mashal a blasphemer in front of others. I met Wajahit's father, a retired university professor. He's a small man with a trim white beard and a gentle face. Had he ever spoken to you about this boy, Mashal Khan, before? Yes. He told me that this guy is talking about uh, uh, blasphemy. I told him, inform your chairman, department chairman, and ask him to settle the problem. He says Mashal was lynched because the authorities failed to act. In the law, nobody should commit blasphemy. Otherwise, he will be hanged. But what will happen if somebody is repeatedly going this and nobody is taking action? So who is responsible for this? Do you think that Michal has some responsibility over his own death? Yes, he is responsible for his own death. I think so. No other body. Wajahat and more than 50 other suspects are being held in Mardan jail. I managed to visit some of them inside. I wasn't allowed to record them, but this was my impression straight after leaving the prison. I've never been in a jail quite like that before. All the relatives of the suspects are gathered in this one small hot room, jostling with each other for position and shouting over each other to try and speak to the suspects who are in this other room directly opposite but separated by this long wire mesh. We did manage to speak to Wajahat, though, and he said that on the day of the murder, no one set out with the intention of killing Michelle. They wanted, in his words to give him a few slaps, hand him over to police and have him expelled from the university. The jail, though, is full of other suspects and I managed to speak to someone who was involved in the physical violence, another journalism student called Imran, who shot Mishal. And he says he has no regrets about what he did. He's very open in saying he believes Mishal Khan deserved to die. Wajahat was reluctant to tell me why things came to a head that particular morning. I'm not sure why, but other sources have told me he'd argued with Michelle just a few days before the killing. When I spoke to him, Wajahat was insistent that Michelle was a blasphemer. He said he'd written down the details of the blasphemy in a letter he sent to a number of religious scholars. I got hold of that letter. One key part talks about a conversation Wajahat and Michelle had about Adam and Eve. Michelle asks, why is incest forbidden in Islam if Adam and Eve's children would have had incestuous relationships with each other for mankind to exist. It might be a controversial question for some, but I don't see how it's blasphemous. But Mashal's killers do have their sympathisers. This rally came just weeks after the murder. Again, Mashal is called a blasphemer. It was addressed by a number of former MPs, including Mulana Shuja al-Mulk, a leading local figure in an Islamist party and one of the clerics Wajahat sent his letter to from prison. The letter that Wajahat wrote that you received as well says that Adam's children must have committed incest for the human race to evolve. Is that blasphemy to, to raise that as a point? This was just one of his many blasphemous questions. He was asking why not have incestuous relationships? Why not lift these restrictions? But you think that wasn't a philosophical argument he was making? He wasn't seeking clarification. 
He was pushing the idea that all our restrictions should be done away with. Go have a relationship with your sister. In fact, he was encouraging this and preaching this. We're talking about whether Michelle committed blasphemy or not, but for lots and lots of people around the world, it's irrelevant. No matter what he said or is alleged to have said, nothing can justify killing someone and especially not in that way. Justification, justification is another matter. It's up to the courts and judges to decide that. If you have to kill someone as punishment, make it quick and with no pain. Just bury him afterwards. Moshul's buried in a plot of land that the family owns. It's a peaceful place and the grave itself is covered in tinsel and with floral garlands left behind by politicians and civil society groups that have come to pay their respects. Michal's father comes here nearly every day. I find it peaceful. I find it very sad too. But when I see the grave, it gives me a lot of peace. Because when you see a great man, it gives you strength. Just a few paces away from the grave, the family are paying out of their own pockets to construct what's called a hudra or a guest house so that people who come and pay their respects to Mashal have somewhere to wash and somewhere to rest. They say they've had people come from as far away as Kabul in Afghanistan. The money was intended for his education and his wedding, which of course will never happen. So we're using it to build this guest house. It's the least we can do. Anyone from any religion or political affiliation can come here, any time. It's clear that Mashal's story has affected many in Pakistan. It's been 40 days since Mashal Khan was brutally murdered. And today, in his home village of Zaida, a rally in his honour is taking place. Hundreds have gathered here. Some have come from across the country just to express their solidarity. Dozens of people have been killed in Pakistan over the past few decades after being falsely accused of blasphemy. But never before has there been this kind of public reaction. This is the first time that Pakistanis have felt confident and safe enough to express support for someone accused of such a sensitive crime. Nevertheless, armed police are dotted around and outside the stadium, a reminder of the tensions behind this case. Activists and Michal's father hope the outrage and debate around his death could lead to a more open society. It's true that he was brutally murdered, but at least it shook the conscience of the world. And those peace-loving, non-violent people came here to our home from across Pakistan to offer condolence and support. They are flowers in this country, and we are now together. Many in Pakistan across the political spectrum are sympathetic to Mashal's case. But for a great deal, that sympathy rests on believing Mashal was wrongly accused of blasphemy. They're focused on punishing Mashal's killers, not examining blasphemy laws themselves, which remain popular. You can see the jail from here, can't you? Yeah, this is just 350 metre, uh, 250 metre. In Mardan, the father of Wajahat, accused of inciting the mob, lives in the shadow of the jail that now houses his son. He worries what will happen to him and also what the future holds for Pakistan. For him, Michal represents a threat to the country's Islamic foundations. If now we are becoming atheist and the people are free to make people atheist, then what was the need of making Pakistan? And do you think this atheism is spreading in Pakistan? I think it is because people like you and the media who are giving more and more attention to such atheistic uh, views, of course it will grab the whole country in very near future. Because nobody will be safe. Their honor will not be in safe hands. And we will lose our identity.
That's the father of one of the accused. He's the polar opposite to the father of the victim. The difference between their views reflects the divisions within Pakistan. We don't say that Mashal's death will bring an immediate revolution in the society. But we need to start a tradition of dialogue and ideas. This is what will bring Pakistan out of crisis. And we're a little hopeful that these ideas will take hold, with help from the people who are coming forward. Then there will be no more darkness. There are still many questions about Michelle's death. Could the police have done more to prevent it? Could the university? And could the killing prove some kind of turning point? Since his death, there have been other mob attacks targeting alleged blasphemers. The court has even sentenced one man to death for supposedly insulting the Prophet Muhammad on Facebook. Michelle's family are desperate for answers and to ensure no one else goes through what they have. But his father tells me when it comes to real justice in Pakistan, no one has ever received it before. That's all for this edition of Assignment. I'm Sekunder Kamani. A lot of people helped to bring you this story. Thanks to Usman Zahid for his work on the ground with me here in Pakistan, Masood Khan for the accompanying TV pieces, to Neil Rizal for the radio production you just heard, and to Radio Free Europe for the clip of Michelle talking at the beginning of the programme. For more gripping audio reportage, subscribe to the BBC World Service documentary feed wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.